I just got back from the Lay Lake Bassmaster Elite Series event, and you guys know the drill. Once again, this week, it will be Jake's take. All the behind-the-scenes Bassmaster goodness that you can handle. Joining me this week, friend of the show, Bassmaster videographer, all-around good guy, Jake Latondras. This week, um... I'm Bob Cobb from the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders. Yes, it is that time again. It is Wednesday. Welcome in, humpers, to the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name. This is episode 110 of the Mercer Podcast. And, um... Hard to believe we continue to grow. If you look right there at the subscriber count, if you're watching on YouTube, if not, if you're watching on the streaming service, make sure to rate, to give us stars, whatever it, it takes, because uh, we work hard and 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 it's not a lot of hard work for you to give us a review, please. If not, let's just move on and not make this uncomfortable. Um, 210,000 subscribers, unbelievable. Speaking of unbelievable, an unbelievable event on Lay Lake. Um, in Alabama, love going to Alabama. Some great, great Bassmaster fans in Alabama. Some fans of of this show, and I thank you all for that. Um, and it's cool, you know. A lot of people will stop by and say, "Watch the show." This like this episode, like that episode. Every once in a while, you guys come bearing gifts, and I got a really cool gift here I have to show off right now. For those of you who don't know, I mean, if you're in Alabama, you know. But the Piggly Wiggly is a um, is a grocery store. And somehow along the way, long story short, I started saying on stage every once in a while, when somebody has a big bag, I will say, somebody went to the Piggly Wiggly and come back with a whole sack full. It was literally just an inside joke between me and another person that has history with Piggly Wiggly. And I said, hey, I'm going to make Piggly Wiggly part of today's weigh-in, and it kind of stuck. But it's paying off now, because we'll check out this bad boy right there. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. If you're not... It is a beautiful blue Piggly Wiggly 2019 Spring Bass Classic. And um, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, thank you for the hat. It's the 25th anniversary Piggly Wiggly hat. Not just any Piggly Wiggly hat from their bass tournament. So thank you very much. And uh, if anybody else knows people from Piggly Wiggly, just send me stuff. It's fine. I mean, Piggly Wiggly is fun to say. And... Um, and sometimes I go play. I mean, when you get up north, people think you made up the Piggly Wiggly line. No, it's 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 a real it's a real grocery store. Um, we had an incredible event this past weekend. Man, you want to talk about a crazy ending to an event? Um, it was pretty pretty crazy, and uh, an amazing champion, Will Davis Jr. And man, he had to battle off. It was Davis versus the Goliaths. Two of them, as a matter of fact, Jason Christie and Brandon Polnick, and he beat them both, but um, not without some drama and some uh, behind-the-scenes scoop, and that's what we're here to tell you. I have a piece of hair or something that is like just flapping in my eye. Um, sorry to be distracted, but the entire time I've been talking, there's been this thing just waving in my face, taunting me. And uh, I had to deal with it. So I've dealt with it. it I believe it's, it was a, a dog hair from my daughter's beautiful white shepherd. Um, great show this week. Crazy amount of behind-the-scenes stuff. If you love the behind-the-scenes stuff, there is some stuff. Um, from the tournament, from previous tournaments, all sorts of stuff happened at this event. And we try to dig into each and every little nugget that we have some information on. So stick around. Don't go anywhere because, well, you don't need to go anywhere because we're about to start the real show. So let's bring in the guest from Colorado, the host of Jake's Take, friend of the show, ice climber, Bassmaster videographer, and all-round good guy, Jake Latonis. It's always a special day when... Jake's take returns to the show, but a triumphant Jake's take. I called you a loser. I said you couldn't win anymore. You had lost all your magic, but it was just the motivation you needed to finally be with an angler. An ang angler. 
during <laughs> their victory. So congratulations. Well, thank you. That was that was a <laughs> man. That was a it seemed like it was a long time coming. I was starting to feel a little pressure there as a camera guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, don't suck like Brian New says. <laughs> I have. I have. I just want everyone to know that I have this very lucky uh, buff face mask. And it's the buff. It, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. There's something to it at this point because not the anglers. Hey, look, right before take not their there, boats. No, no, it's not their it's years my, of education nope, and, and nope. perfection. Ask Polinick. It's the buff. We talked, we talked about it. It's my buff. <laughs> I brought it out uh right before takeoff. I went over to Jason Christie and Brandon Polinick because we were all lined up one, two, three. And I said, Man, I hate to tell you guys this. And I pulled it, I showed it to him. I said, I brought my lucky buff. And I've I've literally worn that thing in Lee Livesey's win at Chickamauga, Lee Livesey's win at Lake Fork, like Brandon Cobb's win at Lake Fork, like Caleb Kufal's win at Gunnersville, Jason Christie's classic win, BP's win at, at Champlain. And I haven't worn it for a while because I was promoting a, a brand and I was wearing <laughs> their buffs. And so I quit wearing it, and then I finally okay. brought it out, and I win. So here we go. So it was Let's the talk buff. about the buff. <laughs> it was all the buff. Yeah, it was all uh, the buff. All right. Well, Jake will be selling little. We'll call it sections of the buff. He's gonna put we'll them in little vials and send Buffy them around the, the bass, world. <laughs> Buffy the Bass Slayer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, a crazy event, obviously. Um. Mm. The first time back to well, the first time the Elite Series has ever visited Lay Lake, which was shocking. Um, and it was cool, kind of the last event, the last classic that I wasn't the MC for, and I had no idea that next classic you'll be emceeing was that Lay Lake classic where Kevin won and um and beeswax creek and the fabled, you know, I was doing twit bids. That's how long I had no idea I was gonna be working for Bass Next Classic. So we've never had an elite there, first elite there. And, um, man, it, it, that event was weird. Like, it was just so crazy. Like, even the, the the ending with the weather and everything, and we'll get there. But from start to finish, that event just had just a lot. You know what I mean? Like, with the last two of these we've done, Jake, we've literally covered two events. You know, we've done back-to-backs, and we've covered them. I feel like this is one event, but we're going to cover more in this show than we did in those those back-to-back -back events we're gonna we're gonna run out of time before we cover everything that we need to cover for this uh lay lake event yeah um, so it was very interesting and i mean the boats that i covered the guys that i covered to you know i mean going back to that that classic that kvd won i mean as i recall that was one of the most literally one of the most publicized classics of our time is that not true that was i remember that being like a big deal it was a big deal but it what made that classic so special is everybody was fishing you know four or five out of the top six were fishing in beeswax creek right there and um it it felt like a a, a golf tournament you know what i mean it felt like i've never been to the masters but it felt like what i would imagine the masters would feel like without the sandwiches um but it literally like you'd hear crowds just these flotilla of it, that's pre-live when flotillas were a lot bigger that's one thing live has made smaller and that's flotillas like we used to have 200 boats following anglers we don't have that anymore because you can literally look at your cell phone at home and, and see more than you can by being on the water but they all you know kevin was in the top six ike was in the top six jeff crete was in the top six there was a bunch of them but as they would catch fish, their flotilla would go off. So it was like, you know, like if you're at the Masters and something happens on a hole that you're not at, you hear that reaction. And every time Jeff Crete heard that reaction, he would just get a little smaller. And because uh, the reaction was happening a lot from Kevin Van Dam, who ironically won the event right in the exact same area that Brandon Polnick almost won this event. And Brandon Polnick had it to himself, which is mind-boggling 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 especially in today's day and age of you know playback research and you know all, historical fact checking and all that stuff it's really hard to believe 
Uh, I don't know what boat number he was, but he certainly wasn't the first one out of the 64. gates. On day. And, and then he shows up and he's got it all to himself. I mean, that was pretty incredible. And kudos to, I mean, who else would be there besides Brandon Polinick? You know, he does his due diligence. He's, he always does his homework and he knew what was up. So good for him. Tiffany told me that he she had to listen to him complain all week because he was like, I, I know the one area where I can catch him, I'm going to have to sit there and take off because I'm boat 64 and I'm going to have to watch boat after boat go in there and know that I, I've got nothing. Well, I think he was 64. He was somewhere right around there. So he saw nobody go in there and he was the only one that went there. Unbeknownst to Brandon Polnick, Lee Livesey is off to the side at a deeper number thinking if nobody goes left, I'm going left. And when Polnick went, he was like, I'm, I'm not rolling in on, you know, it's, it's a small area. And um, that's what I thought would happen to that area. I thought that area would play in the tournament, but I thought there would be five, six boats go to a day one, one or two of them get some weight and the rest of them just cannibalize each other. But it, Polnick literally came within two ounces of that and, and actually, actually, had enough to win the freaking tournament but and this is not taking shade away from will davis but you want to talk about a painful way to lose a bass tournament polinick caught enough weight to win that tournament to become a seven-time bass master winner he had a fish die within 30 minutes of check-in I, I guess call tag got stuck under a partition in his live well or something the fish dies and Polnick doesn't have that dead fish and he wins the tournament. So he lost the tournament because of that dead fish. Um, again, not taking any shade away from Will Davis, just everybody's pointing out how awesome what Polnick did on stage. You know what I mean? What, how he knows how to take a loss and how he jumped up there to get a picture with them and how, I mean, that moment of them with their arms around each other, it was just awesome. But when you take into account that it wasn't just a normal tournament loss, he literally caught enough to win the tournament. But because of um, because of a um, dead fish penalty, he does not win the tournament. So I just, again, no shade on Will Davis Jr. <laughs> that was an incredible win. But um, it showed what an incredible person Paul Nick is to take that kind of a loss as well as he did. When he, when he, went backstage after you announced Will Davis Jr. to be the winner. He came down the steps by the live or the, the tanks, the uh, live tanks came around the stairs to side stage. Yeah. Right. Where Watched. I was standing when he came through, it just had just started pouring rain. It was, it was almost like he was in, he was, he was numb. I can tell you that. And he walked up to me and his face was white. Yeah. I'll never, I'll never forget it. his face was white. And he said, dude, I had a dead, I had a dead fish in my well because of the partition in the live well. And had I had that, had I not had that four ounce uh, deduction, I would have won that tournament. And I didn't know what to say. I just hugged him. And I said, man, you know, we all, we all love you. And, and if there's anyone that can handle this, it's you. And he just kind of eased over to the fence to the, to his right. And really you could tell he wanted to be by himself. Um, Kyle had a camera in his face and, you know, Brandon was kind of like, you know, I need, I need a second. And so, but he kept filming and you could see from the clip that Brandon posted yesterday you know, about what had happened that he was blank faced and he had, he almost had tears in his eyes, Well, yeah. you know? And, and so I'm just saying, I'm saying, you know, it was, it, it was, it was obviously a big pill to swallow. And then within literally within seconds, it was almost like he was over it. He jumped over the fence, jumped up on stage, got his picture taken with Will and was, was the BP that we all know and love and the professional that he is, you know? Uh, I mean, dude, I, I think that people don't give that moment enough credit. Like, I don't think most people, to be totally honest, I don't think most people understand it. And I mean, there's people that stand in that crowd every way and don't understand it. Because True. nobody else visually sees and feels 
everything those anglers go through. You know what I mean? Like they're back at those troughs and the, the, the hour of wondering, is it enough? Is it enough? Is it enough? And the calculations and everything. And, and that way, and dude, the, and we jump way ahead to the end of this tournament. Um, but we'll, we'll get, we'll, we got a lot of stuff to There's just so in much on more to week. it than that. Yeah. yeah. But, um, Dude, that moment was weird. Like that winning moment was almost angelic. It was nuts. Like to stand on that stage and, and I hate that our stream went down in the middle of it because I mean, it was a torrential storm. Um, it literally that way and went, and I made a joke, but I think people, unless you were standing there and feeling it, you had no idea, but, but it literally went from the beginning of the way. And I walked on that stage and I'm like, how are these people going to last 10 anglers? Like everybody was just Band and the people sitting in their seats just sweating just sitting there and i'm like this is i mean it's so hot and uncomfortable but then within one angler the wind picked up and then it started raining and and then it intensified and kind of let off and then we get down to our final two anglers and and i'm looking out and i'm like people are drenched like the, the, this is the coolest thing about this sport all these people that are still standing here and then will ways and the you know, Christy, like to have Will chasing down Christy and Polnick alone, you know what I mean, was insane. It, it's 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 insane, Davis versus dude. Goliath, dude. It, that's what it oh. was. And um, so it gets down to Polnick and him. And dude, I'm giving this big friggin' intro for Paul because I've I've always been told that like just steam along. If if there's something like if we're concerned about the electricity in the area or something. They'll let me know. So I'm, I'm like, there's no time wasting this. Let's fire Just through. Roll let's, it out. We've got people yeah. waiting here. You know, let's keep going. So I'm giving Polnick this intro, which is exhausting because the dude has accomplished so freaking much. And dude, at the second I say from Rathra Idaho, the prodigy Brandon Polnick, dude, he walks on stage and like it was a freaking biblical Disney written picture biblical yeah. all of a sudden you hear thunder and it was just ah! <laughs> to be standing there it was just really weird and oh, then man when the fish sit there and i think he needed 11 six or wh whatever it was he was a few ounces short of it but he came up 11 three and I, and I remember I announced it and dude, like at the exact second I announced it and nobody got to see this other than I want to literally sit and talk to Brandon and Will about it because I don't even think Lisa got to see it because she's busy trying to get the weight of the fish. She's looking down. But if you were just looking straight at that crowd when they had their arms around each other, there was a moment that that weight gets announced, dude. And at that very moment, like the entire audience, because everybody thought Brandon was going to win, that entire audience shoves their arms up in the it. air. The exact same move that Will did at the exact, like literally the it whole an audience. Eruption. And the freaking rain starts teeming at that moment. And they're all just running towards the stage. It was. No one cared. It was raining at that point. No, no. But it was so, insane. So the reason I got so dramatic and went through all of that process is to kind of give people an idea of like, you imagine being Paul Nick. You've led this tournament since day number one. You you know that there's it didn't go perfect at certain times. You know, but but you're the last guy to go on the stage. You're wondering if you have enough. Next thing you know, boom, boom, two shots in the face. You're off the stage, and you were literally looking up at some other dude hoisting a tree. Not that you you aren't happy for that dude, but it's just such an emotional like. Dude, you shouldn't talk to me 15 minutes after I come off stage because I'm an idiot. God knows what the <laughs> anglers are going through. <laughs> oh, it was it was it was truly biblically insane at that yeah. moment. And everyone knew it. People were filming with their cameras, like they were they were people knew this was before you even announced Polynix, you know wait when after you had already given him his introduction and people like everyone had their cameras out filming this because it was turning into this 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 holy moment it was <laughs> unbelievable and um you know don't forget too that you know jason christie i mean he, he <laughs> lost a five pounder at the freaking boat you know, he and, says and it's five and i think it was even bigger than that he says no been. it was only five but in the slow-mo man it it Regardless it was a big of what fish. it was, he lost. It was a it was a winner. Is moments. what it was. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was absolutely a winning fish. Had he boated that fish, and I mean, and and the fact that that fish choked that frog and was skin hooked is just, hey man, 
you know, they always say when it's your day, it's meant to be. And some of those things that go down that you're lucky enough to get through, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, a boat dock rope or whatever it is, you know, pillars, trees yep. on crankbaits, pin fish, all that stuff. Sometimes they don't go your way. And, you know, you want to talk about what happened to Will Davis Jr. Um, that afternoon that I got to witness. It was just he and I, no other camera boats, no followers. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Let's, let, it was we, insane, dude. Insane. We got to reel this back in or it's going to be insane. ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> so, yes. Last thing about the weigh-in before we go into the final day of the tournament. We got to get to the first day of the tournament. But last yeah. thing about the weigh-in. And, dude, maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe <laughs> I'm trying to insert something in it that didn't happen. I don't know. The first weird moment in that way and that really stood out for me was when I was talking to Will. Before Christy and before Brandon had even weighed in. So Will says to me, and he makes kind of a joke, which a lot of anglers make, let's just go on and get this way in going. And to me, as the tournament MC, as the guy who's supposed to try to bring as much drama out of this stuff as possible. In my head, when anglers say that, I'm like, well, we're just going to drag it on a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> but he finishes his thought. He finishes his thought. And generally, I will be, you know, that's when I'll give him a, yeah, but come on, let's look at your family. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good move. Right. Look at your family now. <laughs> Tell me what's going through your mind. And that's a good move um, as a tournament MC. But before I even get a chance to even do that, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to follow him up with one more question, then I'll send him to the hot seat. Because it's it's about building up that moment, not not just for the crowd, but for also for him when he looks back at this. And and no one dude, knew who won that tournament. No, no, no one had knew. no idea. Had no, no idea. One. No one. And, and to be honest, the reason that you do that with a Will Davis as an MC, that people don't think about these things, but the reason you do that is because Will Davis – may not win this tournament. I mean, there's still two incredible anglers you have to weigh. You want to give him that moment to show that respect to his family. You want to give him that emotion because that's what in makes people invest in the angler because they're like, man, I like that guy. Um, mm -hmm. So at the moment where I was about to ask him a second question, for the first time in that way, and the rain got really bad, and it just, whoa, and it was like almost like, he said he didn't want to talk and, and nature gave him a reason not to talk and like, the, shut up, Dave, let's get on with this. Let's go. <laughs> and when we did fire through, um, but before we go there, before we get to, to how it all ended, like we just did from the beginning, let's start on day number one of this tournament, which seems like so much more than four days. Um, on day one, it seemed like uh, a whole different tournament. It day does. One. It does. Nice. I mean, and here's, I also got to hit this before we get into that. One of the biggest talked about things from this tournament is the Keith Poche stuff, which ironically, I just found out you knew nothing about because you were on the water. Yeah. Um, Keith Poche had a TQ'd from an event at Toledo Bend, a Bassmaster Open. Um, he was not happy with said disqualification. Um there's, and I'm not going to even talk about said disqualification because I'm not, I, it's, I'm not a journalist, people. Every once in a while, people will be like, you should be a better journalist. I'm not, I just talk to fishermen and, and camera dudes and people I know. That's, we have conversations. We just try to stay out of trouble, man. But in a situation like this, I think that both ends deserve the credit for me. If I'm going to talk about that, I need to have done enough research on both ends to, to present it properly. So I'm not going to talk about it, but you know, basically Keith says he was fishing in an area that he could have fished bass. DQ'd him for how he accessed said area basically is what I've been told, regardless of where you fit on that. The weirdness that's out there that people are like bass is against Keith Poche. Bass doesn't want, but no bass doesn't care that he fishes MLF. You know, would we rather he just fish the elite? Sure. Of course. That's stupid. John Cox does the same. We do we have do we have anything against John Cox? No, nothing against either of these guys. But Keith Poche will self admittedly tell you that that's the area where he lives, right on that. That's why he runs that kind of boat to get an advantage in certain situations, and and he'll have to deal with a disadvantage in certain situations. That stuff to monopolize this event, I have no idea why it did. I, I there's many reasons, but. 
we have nothing against Keith Poche. Uh, you know what happened on stage in day one? He kind of came up and was short with me and kind of walked off, didn't even get his weight. I was going to call Keith that night to be like, dude, your strife, your it has nothing to do with this at tournament. It's got nothing to do with these anglers, with these spectators. So when you walk up the crowd, you just, it doesn't look good. Keith, in his defense, called me before I ever called him that night. While I was driving home from the weigh-in, it shows up. Keith Poche calls and he said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm sorry. I didn't have, that wasn't against you. That was against, um, I, who knows? He said my head was just wasn't in the right just place. An, an attitude that he was yeah. in at the moment. Yeah. And that's all I'll take from this. I mean, I thought about asking Keith to come on the podcast, but I also don't want to, again, I don't need to get in the, there's podcasts who, who love that kind of stuff. <laughs> that's not what I love to be involved in. I have nothing against Keith. I think Keith is a very valuable pro in the elite series. I think he brings a different element to things. I think the way he thinks outside of the box is, is what you expect from a champion. I think Keith did a few dumb things this week though. Like, to be honest, like you, this is an open event and the first two days of the tournament, he voluntarily left last. And on the second day he left and just sat out front. So, I mean, people are talking about that obviously because it's abnormal. I mean, if somebody, if somebody takes off and doesn't leave the dock or they're in the penalty box, people talk about it. People were talking about the Keith Poche thing. So Keith, let's, I mean, come to more Bassmaster Elite Series events. I look forward to seeing you in the future and hopefully all this gets worked out. Nobody hates you. We all love you. We really do. Um, Everybody knows she's just trying to make a living too. It's not, you know, and, 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 you know, walking on the fence or, or straddling the fence of rules or, or areas, you know, off limit areas or whatever it is. I mean, you're going to get some of this and bass has to make decisions, not based on who it is, but what's going on. And, you know, these decisions, uh, determine a lot of, uh, attitudes towards the future and the past and brings up a lot of, you know, negativity, but at the end of the day, the rules are the rules and they're set in place and, you know, people have to make really big decisions and they have to erase who it is involved in these decisions and just make the decisions that's, that, that creates the best outcome for the sport and the event. Right. Yeah. And, and dude, Keith Poche can fish. I mean, Keith oh, Poche absolutely. weighed 13 pounds in the second day of this tournament, proven that once again. But here's my only thing is like, leave those things at those events. Like if something happens, move on to the next event. Like right. I can't, and, and I don't feel like, I mean, that was, I mean, on day one, when he idled away from the dock, he literally repeatedly just repeated to every person as he idled past the dock. I was wrongfully... I was wrongfully disqualified. I was wrongfully disqualified over and over. And I'm like, dude, you were idling out on day one of an elite series event in protest of something that happened a month ago at a Bassmaster Open. Don't. I mean, the best. Anyways, I'm enough on Keith Combs. Keith, not Keith Combs. Keith Boche. I mean, there's a lot of Keiths. I, I like Keith Combs, too. I'm trying to get him to do some of his incredible impersonations on stage, but it is a battle. Um, but. As far as that goes, don't read more into it. Like, I mean, I've read it's Bass doesn't like people in aluminum boats. Like, why would Bass not like people in aluminum boats? Why would it be? There's, it's just the foolish. Last two classics were won in aluminum Yeah, exactly. Boats. <laughs> exactly. Like, it's, it's just foolish. So stop, 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 stop. The world is too happy for the world to be obsessed with. We're fishing. You know, the craziness we're fishing. Comes from They're this. fishing you know for a living. Mean? Like, yeah. And, and here's, I mean, you have to understand it's all the calls that are made at Bass have to be made with more than just one situation in mind. Exactly. Keith exactly. has a video on his very own social media. And if that is the said video that he jumped, that's the concrete, he puts in it, concrete dam, no troubles for the brand of boat that he runs. I'm not saying it not because I don't know the name. I think it's, is it Gator Tracks or something? It's. I don't yes, know the name yeah, and I'm going to say so, it wrong. Yeah. So if that's, if that is the dam, if that is the thing he jumped, if that is the, 
dude, you can't look at that video and be like, that's what we want the sport to be. Like, that's, I love that people are doing things to access, but you also have to think of college anglers, high school anglers. It's the exact same way I felt when MLF allowed anglers to jump in the water, swim down and unhook a bait or unhook a fish is tangled. That's nuts. Not because I don't think that angler can accomplish said task, because I think that there's going to be a 15 year old kid that is going to jump in the water and it's not going to work out good at some point. And if you don't believe that those kids pay attention to what the elite series anglers do, just pay attention to the word grind. There was a time that that was hardly said on stage at any way. And now it is the most said name on stage. Let's get into this tournament. Speaking of grinds, <laughs> the tournament. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was, uh, we hit it at a weird time, but you went out on day one with our leader in progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year points at what Gerald Swindle calls the quietest, you know, most underrated lethal pros there is out there. And that is the COWB, Brandon Cobb, and uh, his incredible season continues. He, Brandon Cobb, COWB, as you call him, is an incredible angler. And he has been, I mean, I remember, you know, filming him win on Lake Fork and just really being very impressed with his presentation, his knowledge of what's going on underwater, all those things. He is very, very talented and, uh, you know, and, and comes across as young as he is. He comes across as being a really a, an old veteran at times. Um, and I love riding in the boat with him. That's been, it's been a while since I had been in Cobb's boat, but when I jumped in, I, I felt right at home and, um, you know, was anxious to see what he had in store for Lay Lake. How did day one go for him? I think he caught him pretty decent, didn't he? Yeah, he caught, he he said when we left the dock, he said, "Man, if I can get thirteen or fourteen pounds, I'll be happy." And I think he weighed like fourteen and some fourteen thirteen or something like that, almost fifteen pounds. So he was happy, you know, with what he brought to the scales. But you know, uh, I'm not going to pretend the fact that it wasn't a grind either. He was like, he caught, I bet he caught, I, I say a grind. It was a grind to find bigger fish because yeah. he probably caught 40 or 50 fish that day. <laughs> grind. And, and, <laughs> but everything was 12, 11 and a half to 12 and a 16th inch long, you know? And he had at one time he had five, 12 inches in his boat and he was fishing all these, you know, these pockets uh, of these creeks, looking for, you know, uh, grass, uh, grass, little grass mats that were holding some bigger fish. And man, he threw a frog. He threw, um, I think he threw, he threw swim baits, obviously. And eventually he started, he started watching the grass move in these little, in these little grass clumps. He's like, man, I know those fish are there. I can see them. You know, and there'd be a time or two where a shad would flicker up out of there or something. You go, those have to be bass. So he ends up picking up a wacky worm and a spinning rod and tosses a wacky worm in there and and just goes to freaking catching them almost every cast. And it was like almost entered. It was almost uh, it was almost comedy at that point. It makes me wonder why he doesn't just always throw that. I mean, 80% of the fish that he has weighed in this year, me and him were joking about it. Takeoff one day. I'm like, like, what is it? 80, 85. He's like, yeah, has to be 85% of the fish I've weighed in this year have come on a little wacky worm. Well, we talked, you know, he and I talked about that when, when things started going well later in the day. And, you know, I brought up the fact that if you look back at really the last two AOI winners, Brandon Polnick and Seth fighter, then, you know, you, you talk about some of the interviews that, that they had talking about how basic, like all the baits, like Seth Fighter had three baits all year, the year he yeah. was Angler of the Year. And Brandon Pollock talked about how basic and fundamental, you know, his year was last year winning AOI. And now you look at, at Brandon Cobb and, you know, in the, in the, in the voice of, of so many people talking about front facing sonar and, and high tech equipment and, you know, polished baits and these really, uh, these big advancements in, in bass fishing, it still boils down to the basic fundamentals of the sport. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's cool. And I like, I like to hear that and I like to see it. 
I feel like there's more to that too, though, when you really think about it, like while you were saying that I was thinking about it, I'm like, you're right. There's a lot of times an angler of the year gets on a handful of baits. And so it, is that just because the angler figured out the right baits or is that because the angler is fishing so well, they're not searching. You know what I mean? Like if an angler is dialed as tournament, just individual tournaments, not the season as an angler progresses through a tournament, generally by the weekend and things like that, unless it's a, a different kind of event. And that would classify this as a different kind of event because you had fish in transition. You only see three to five rods on their deck. When they're not on them, you see 35. But you know what I'm saying? Like, so the same thing could yeah. probably be said for when you're dialed in and you're having that season, you have a handful of baits. But when you're still trying to search to try and get to be that guy, you're firing through more baits. I think too, you know, when they find, when they find a, when they unlock a, a, a situation, a pattern, then they go to, you know, it's not about, it's really not about what you're throwing. It's about understanding what's going on down there. And they do reach for, you know, the basic, basic tools that they need to see if those fish are going to bite. And once they start biting, then the confidence level comes in, the confidence uh, you know, comes in and then they're, they're not going to pick up another bait and try something different because that's working. Like don't fix what's, or don't try to fix something that's not broken. Right. And I think that carries them through the rest of yeah. the tournament. And I think it's just the patterns that they fall upon. I mean, who knows? He could have thrown a, a, a shaky head in there and started catching them. And all of a sudden the wacky worm, never shows up you know yeah I, I don't i don't know that but i'm just saying it's just it's just a pattern they get locked into and they just don't leave it and confidence breeds confidence and then on top of that i think it's also played into his game plan because we dude we fished we followed the same bite all season for the most part you know what i mean whether it, it pre-spawn spawn post-spawn fish it's all fish that are somewhere in that transition the water temperature is probably within 10 degrees of the first event and the last event we had so it stayed you know what i mean that bite has stayed strong what's one thing that happens on the water <clears throat> with brandon cobb that shocks you or that would shock people that people aren't used to seeing that happened through the day where you were like huh tricky question huh I that's a good there. question one of the things that he and i talked about that may not be shocking but that is very true uh, from my perspective as a camera guy on different boats and let's just say i'm on three different boats like i was at lay lake over a four-day tournament and anglers going to the same exact locations at different times not knowing i mean yeah Someone was there. Think and it's fresh. Do, yeah, doing either the same exact thing or com something completely different. And and Cobb and I talked about that for a while. How how interesting that is. I can't say anything because I'm supposed to be neutral, as energetic and and cheerful as I am in the boat. You know, I, I can't say anything about stuff like that. So it is very interesting. And ironically enough after day one that I, when I was in Cobb's boat, the first place we go to or the second, maybe the second or third place we go to, I go to with Jason Christie on day is that two. same exact place that Brandon Cobb caught all the, all of his fish on day one and out in front, Jason couldn't catch a thing. Like nothing yeah. was working. And I'm just sitting there going, if only he'd pick up that wacky rig. <laughs> <laughs> I do it to, uh, that hat stands out even more so like when me and Overstreet would cover, we would, there'd be tournaments we'd sit on a point and pull down and literally half the field would come through and they all like, you'd see a boat come blister around the corner. And if somebody's Whoa. fishing it, they're like, ah, and they turn away or, but literally then there's some that come around the corner and literally the waves from the boat leaving have just dissipated. Like they just, Right. I mean, it, you can still smell the boat leaving and right. they come around the corner and they're like, yes, I got it to myself. But the weird thing is you'll watch 15 guys fish a point or fish an area and the 11th guy catches them. It's crazy. The perception we all have of, and I'm guilty of it. Everybody listening is probably guilty of it. You're fishing and you're like, oh, somebody hit those docks or somebody. Right. 
don't doesn't even matter to them anymore or at no. least for the most part you know you don't want to be fishing a, a bedfish area and and see john cox leaving you know yeah. or drew cook <laughs> or something like that that's totally different <laughs> but i mean even at, at this at this particular moment that we're talking about or this particular event at lay lake so Cobb's catching all of his stuff out sort of out in front of the creek uh -huh. in these grass patches Jason couldn't catch him there. Okay. And he goes in and I remember day one Cobb goes, well, I want to kind of want to go back there, but I know it's too shallow and I don't want to get stuck. And that's, it's just going to take up too much time. So instead of doing that, we leave. Then on day two, when Jason shows up to the same Creek, he goes back into the shallow area in his skeeter and, and starts catching them on a frog, literally like out in front of this little, grass patch with a mud flat and these geese were going crazy I, I, it was it was super loud and like it was kind of almost like there's a lot of life here even though yeah. they're geese and ducks and things there's just a lot of life here so he starts uh flipping a frog over this little grass patch and boom one blows up on it and he misses it so he pulls down and he catches two more off of this super <laughs> shallow muddy what i called a, a ghetto ditch right at the mouth of this ghetto ditch. I mean, it was just like ga a gar hole, right? Okay. So he, he catches these two fish, puts them in his well, and he he uh, trims his motor, his, his engine up some more, tilts his, his trolling motor up to get through this shallow water and goes back into this nasty looking gar hole kind of place. He goes, but, man, I'll before you go, stop. Okay. Because okay. what you just pointed out there, honestly, and I know people just hear words. You know what I mean? A lot of you're driving. You're you just listen to our voices to get away from the traffic jam you're in or whatever. Those little things you just pointed out, because people like to be like, well, why is Jason Christie better at that? Why is Brandon exactly. Cobb better at this? It's little things like that. You know, exactly. you can spend as much time out in your backyard casting at as many buckets as you want and become good at casting because they're all good at that. But it's taking those extra little steps. You know what I mean? Like lifting your trolling motor and a lot of guys will put a piece of wood under there or or a shoe, a, a rope a or shoe. a shoe or something. Yeah. So it raises your trolling motor up just that much more. And you're so that you don't much have to silent. stand there holding it. Exactly. Little and, things. And, and it's quiet. You're not stirring the mud up. You're not causing vibration on the uh, in the dirt to to spook the fish in front of you. All these things. Even yeah. the ducks were letting us get close to them. And <laughs> well, and if, I've said, hey, and I've said, yeah, exactly. He's like parting the Red Sea here. <laughs> but I have said this many times to people. People ask me what what's up with Jason Christie, and and what makes him so good. I said he's he's very quiet. Yeah. Very, he 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 doesn't slam his locker doors. He shuts them really quietly, and he hand twists them and hand puts the handle down. All that stuff. He is very meticulous and detail oriented about being stealthy and and all those things. So he finally gets down into this ditch and looks down, and there's like a four or five pounder. And he goes, "I I know that fish. I saw it during practice. I think he may have even shaken it off." And he goes, but we're going to keep going back up in here. So he passes that fish because we kind of spooked it. And he goes back there and he sees another one and catches, I think it was a four pounder. He catches one and then keeps going back into this get, there's trash back there. There's, there's abandoned trailer houses. I mean, <laughs> it is literally a freaking ghetto, right? And I'm just going, this is amazing. This is an amazing that he would even think to come back here when visually from back there, you look down in there and you're like, that's nothing more than a, a shallow gar hole full of trash fish, maybe some carp and some gar. And that's about it. And he goes back there and sees three or four fish that he didn't catch. Uh -huh. But, but, and it's late in the afternoon, but I know what he's thinking. He's thinking, this is my setup spot for the next day, right? Because there are, there are winning fish back here. You're talking about four and five pound fish on lay Lake. Those are winning fish, right? Yeah. So eventually, uh, I don't want to jump ahead to day three at the tanks, but you know, I asked him when he came in on day three, I forget what he had 13 or 14 pounds. Um, I said, where'd you catch your fish? 
And he said that one ghetto ditch that you called it. And then back there where he was frogging, where he caught that really, that really big one. Yeah. Yeah. Which, He's so cool to be in the boat with, man. I love riding with Jason. Why? Because he's he's so serious, yet at the same time, he's, uh -huh. he's, he's he's very friendly. He's very he's not the intimidator that everyone thinks he is. I mean, he is because he's Jason Christie and everyone fears him. But at the end of the day, he's I mean, he's he is a lot of fun to talk to. And he asks me questions like like we went back and started talking about the classic he's like well what were you thinking when i came up there and after welcher had already weighed his fish what were you thinking like he was asking me we're in a tournament and he's asking yeah. me what i thought about the the the, the moments before he won the classic <laughs> it was so it's just so cool man yeah and i'm i might be part of the guilty party for that whole fear thing about christy but i, I swear because i always say he's one of the most feared names in professional bass fishing but in my defense, and to clarify, I never meant it like you're feared because he's going to show up outside of your car and beat the crap out of you. I just meant, right, right, dude. When he showed up in the Elite Series, he was one of the most feared names. Like at that time in the Elite Series, this is pre-split, but that that is the time when Ayler comes and such and such comes. There's just all these names that came, and and there was respect put on all those names as they came. But there was nobody that arrived on the Elite Series where in Elite Series pros don't really fear anyone in most situations. You know what I mean? They're very confident. They, But if they ever feared anybody, it's him. And that's what I mean. I mean, I, I never meant it as like he's going to be the it's trap. But he, he probably could. Fear. But there is the fear that other anglers feel is out of respect to him because they know like, dude, this guy's in this tournament. Name a spot where Christie's not going to be part of this. You know what I mean? Like right. our next two events, how polar opposite are they? We're going to go to Orange, he won Texas. The Sabine. Yep, he I won mean, there. He, yeah, and then we're going yeah. to go to the St. Clair. Guess what? He won there. I mean, yep. he wins everywhere. Um, yep. I I was I got together with him and Gussie and um, their significant others, um, Shannon and Shelby, um, the night before, and. Uh, Christy was very confident. You know what I mean? Like going into that day. And, uh, but I, I dig what you're saying. Like the whole, he does do the, you know, the silent strong, then he'll give you that smile or whatever. I mean, he's Clint Eastwood, dude. He's, he's, he's dirty. He's a young, dirty, hairy. He, but, I mean, uh, he, he goes from, he goes from saying, oh, how much do you think that fish weighs to, Man, I just want to punch someone in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, so, he is a great guy, and 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 to to put an exclamation point behind that right after weigh-ins, which you know he's he's as he's probably not as bummed as Polinick was based on the circumstances, but still bummed. I mean, did you see the clip where he loses that five pounder and he punches the water? He literally. <laughs> beat the water up <laughs> i heard and, it just stopped rippling today yeah exactly. from that punch <laughs> and then he turns around and drives home nine and a half hours to see his daughter's yeah. uh ceremony uh, scholastic ceremony at that and that's the kind of guy jason christie is okay yeah. let's just make that very clear right now he's he's a cool dude man love that he's pretty guy. incredible so as you Alluded to on day three, he weighed in the uh, biggest bag of the tournament, 23 pounds even. The biggest fish, not just of the tournament, but of the year. After we left <laughs> Santee Cooper Lakes, everybody's like, well, Cobb has Phoenix Boats, $10,000 bonus for Big Bass of the Year. You get your weekly bonuses, $3,000, I think, for Big Bass for the overall, and then there's daily bonuses. But everybody was like, Cobb's won it. Earlier that morning, Swindle and Brock Mosley were on uh bass live the live mix and they're talking and they're like well nobody's gonna beat him well little did they know that on day three on lay lake jason christie brings in a nine four the biggest bass of the year he's now leading the phoenix boats big bass of the season i think maybe the only spot he could get beat and if this happens i will uh, it'll be a, a mess it'll be on a the 10 stage. pound so small to, mouth right yeah like go catch a <laughs> go catch a nine six small mouth or something yeah uh, yeah. which I don't think will happen that time of year, but incredible. 
and dude, that that way that that was one of the favorite big bass that I've ever been on stage for. Because you know, I I generally don't. I generally don't know who's going to win intentionally. Um, I mean, I, I could have text. I almost thought about it. I almost thought about texting you on Sunday when I you were with on, Will. I didn't text you on purpose. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and it was close enough that nobody could have said crap because if you thought you guessed it right, you probably guessed it wrong because it was wrong if it wasn't for a penalty. Right. Um, <clears throat> so I had no idea that for whatever reason, normally a big bass, I, somebody says, did you see the fish Christie caught or whatever? He put it in as a seven, which I give him a pass on because you catch a sure. giant like that. You're like, you just it's for it sure a well. seven, but probably an eight, but it's a seven for sure. You know, you just, so I didn't know. So he weighs 23 pounds. And for those who don't know how much I scamper around the States, the reason I do it is I'm always trying to get out of the picture. So the angler has a clean shot of them holding it without me wiping my sweat off my head or whatever behind them. So I go over to go to the corner to, to yell some stuff while he holds up two fish thinking he weighed in 23. And in my head, he's got fours and fives in there. And um, so in the corner of my eye, I literally just see the head of that fish coming out of the bag. Like I literally, it was just up to its gill plate. It wasn't even, out of the corner of my eye, and it was one of the first fish that I've ever remember looking at, and I haven't even seen the fi fish, and I'm like, that's the biggest bass of the year. Like, new, like an instantly. Gigantic um, fish. And Street got a really cool picture, because I'm actually, like, running across the stage, pointing at him, because I was that, like, excited. I was like, holy, like, so congrats. Congrats. A nine. There's a backstory to this. Okay, okay? give it to the, us. That's why they tune the, in. This is the nugget of the tournament, I'll promise you. May, well, maybe, maybe not. There's some more so, nuggets. Yeah, there are. So, <laughs> so we go back up this creek, right, where Jason uh, was throwing a frog, and he had a lot of confidence back there. This is day two, and mind you, Jason only weighed nine. He weighed nine thirteen on day two, so it wasn't the bag that he wanted, but it kept him in 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 the race because he had 16 and a half on day one right so he goes back uh he fishes all these other areas and then he's like okay we're going frogging at what whatever it was 10 o'clock or 10 30 when the sun's up and finally comes out and he goes back under this railroad bridge and i'm like holy moly this is like the holy grail there's like lily pads and there's it's this creek and there's pockets everywhere and in every pocket it looks like you know the upper mississippi where ish won a few years ago yeah. and throwing a frog i mean it was just beautiful we spent three almost three and a half hours back there and he had one bite the entire time and it was a two pounder that he needed but it was a two pounder and man, he is just scratching his head. We're idling back out of this creek to get, you know, back out to the bridge where we could, where we could uh, full throttle again. Cliff Prince is coming in. He's fishing the edge of the creek along this, uh, this dam or whatever it was. One and, of the nicest human beings on earth. <laughs> yeah, very. And Jason stops. He waves at him. I, I was actually videoing this on my phone. I have the whole conversation on my phone. And he, Jason waves at him. He goes, dude, I just spent three and a half hours back there and had one bite. They ain't biting back there, bro. And he says, I'm out. And then, you know, eases up a little ways and then full throttles out of there. And we go completely different. We go go to the, that's where we went to the the ghetto ditch. So Cliff Prince, so Jason that night at like 8 30 that night, Jason texts me and goes, you remember me telling you that, uh, you know, that place back there has got fish in it. They just weren't biting. I said, yeah, he goes, well, after we passed Cliff Prince, he just texted me earlier and said he went back there and caught a six, four and a four pounder. And I said, and I, and he was like, you know, he sent me some emojis like that's just my luck or that's the way it goes or whatever. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I know where he's going tomorrow because that just gave pro that information probably just gave him the confidence to go back there. So that's where he went on day three back to that location. And that's when he caught, you know, his nine, four and whatever else he caught back there on a frog in the same exact locations. So huh. there was a nugget to that whole, you know, return to those lily pads decision. 
Did you ask Jason about that or is it just hearsay? No, he did you ask him if it mean? affected him. Like, did you ask him if that was that the reason you went back? Oh, absolutely. We oh, talked okay. about it. Well, I have the text okay. messages. Yeah, I believe you. you don't have to. Yeah. Don't, don't. Hey, dude, don't be calling me out like that. Bro. We don't have to have a case. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my attorney involved. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Speaking of attorneys, um, attorneys have been a big thing this year. Really got me in a little trouble, too. Uh, when Jason Christie weighs nine pounds on day two. Is that the moment when you were like, hey, maybe I'm done. Maybe I am. I mean, not even Christy can catch him with me <laughs> in the boat at this point. I mean. No. <laughs> no. Dude, I go into every morning with full confidence that I'm going to win a tournament. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't let, I leave day two behind when I go into day three because it's a new day, boy. Yeah. No, yeah. It, no, it was, it was a frustrating day, but I saw things that, I knew was going to help him the next day. He just saw too many fish, yeah. especially back there in that ghetto ditch. I mean, I just, you know, he was building. And On I behalf only of have people that live in ghettos. We want to apologize right yeah, now. My, I bad, mean, that... my bad. I live in a ghetto. <laughs> Come on, Jake. And so <laughs> the show's getting big. We got to be better than that. <laughs> and so <laughs> I grew up in a ghetto. That's why I call them ghettos. So. <laughs> And I, and I had him at like eight, four after day two, that was my bass track. Uh -huh. And he asked me, he goes, what do you think I really have? And I said, I think you got at least nine pounds. And then Shanna at the docks, she and I were talking and I said, he's got over nine pounds. I don't think he's got 10, but he's got over nine pounds. And with day two being a slower day than the rest of them, I felt like, you know, he's not out of it. He's going to, he's going to stay in the top 20 and as tight as those weights were going into after day two, I mean, he was only like, what? He was only like two pounds, 17, he was 17th place after day two. And it was only like yeah. a pound and a half out of the top Close. 10. Very, very, if that. So, you know, I felt, I knew that I wasn't going to be in his boat again on day three, but then when I saw the assignment sheet for day three, um, and I was in Will Davis Jr.'s boat. I was like, well, this ought to be really cool and interesting. I'd never met Will before in my life, um, but I knew he was a hammer at Lay Lake. And, you know, he and his dad had a big reputation there. They have a, some backstory with Aaron Martins there and oh, some yeah. bait development and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So I, I thought, okay, well, if nothing else, I'm going to get to jump in this boat. And I'm going to get to see some local stuff that – probably no one else knows about so i was i was pumped for that it's it's funny we should talk about this at the events but so i get the same text you get or email where it shows camera assignments and when i saw it i was like well jake's gonna finish the tournament in will's boat like i mean i didn't have, told what, me that it, yeah I, I, i'm like that's his dad actually said that to me in day three and i said he'll be here tomorrow trust me just because mm -hmm. Dude, he's made every cut this year except for one. And the one that he missed, he was 57th. So he's just outside. Um, rookie of the year is going to be Dakota Lithium. Rookie of the year is going to be ridiculously hard to win. Think about it. At this point in the season, two out of five Elite Series champions are rookies. <laughs> We've had how many of them in the top 10? You know what I mean? Like you go through, Koya Fujita's made two top 10s. Um, you, Brian Smith, you know, there's so many of them. Like, Extremely look at how accomplished the rookies are. It's crazy. I mean, it, there it used to be a time where, like, if you make the classic, you'll probably win rookie of the year because there's only going to be one of them make the classic. It's wild. It's wild. And Will Davis is so tell me what it, what it's like to be in his boat because Will is one to his advantage as an angler. Anytime I've spent with Will, he is, you know. If you wanted to write down like a respectful Southern young man, that, that, that is. Oh yeah. He's very that is Christian. Will Davis Jr. Very, but also very mellow. Like I've never seen him get real emotional or anything. Is that different when you're on the water with him? Mm, yeah, I wouldn't. I definitely would not call him mellow. Like okay. Brandon Cobb is mellow. Um, Jason Christie is mellow for the most part. Will is a is little bit more, uh, I'm not going to use the word flamboyant, but, or flashy, but he's got, a, he's got this, 
he he's just fishing. It's like he's just excited to be there. Yeah. And he knows where the fish are. And he's just pumped. He's just got a some energy. He's got some energy to him that I that I was feeding off of from the very right from the get go from take yeah. off. And and I His knew family I knew, too. I like at that event. I felt it was real cool. Like there was like a a Will Davis cocoon around him in the morning, like. Because obviously all his family's there and a lot of families always around him, but there was like a wall. Like when I needed to interview him, I had to be like, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me to get to him. But just all good, positive people around him. Like, it, you know what I mean? It wasn't They're like, go get him, Will. Him. They were just like, Will, you're going to do what you do. <laughs> They're just waiting, wait, just sitting there waiting for him like. You know, they're like they're waiting on him to take off and he's going on, he's going to get on an airplane and fly to some foreign <laughs> land, you know, and, you know, he's, he's very, um, he's very direct about giving credit to all the anglers that he's fished with on Lay Lake. He's very direct about making sure that I knew and that he told, he reminded himself over and over again about how much credit he gave to his dad yeah. for raising him the way that he did being as accomplished as he is in that area and what he's done for the sport, particularly on lay Lake, you know, bait development, um, technique development, location development, thinking outside the box. I mean, you know, the way he caught, really the two winning fish at the end of the day on day four, which we'll talk about in a second, you know, was really unorthodox and out of the ordinary. And I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, I'd seen this technique before, but not where he did it and how he did it. So, you know, and, and he never took credit for being, you know, for doing that on his own or by himself. He constantly, like there were two boats following us around two a blue and a, a green nitro and they were his buddies and they stayed well away from us and they never said a word, but he felt their presence the entire time and knew those guys were there supporting him without saying a word. And, you know, I, for, I, I felt like I was on, you know, the lake with the guy that, that really kind of owns that lake. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 I don't know how to describe it, but it was a, it was a really, really cool experience. I'm so glad I didn't know what I was getting into when I found out, you know, he was going to be my assignment, but at the end of the day, I mean, obviously the win was great, but it was really fun getting to know Will, um, understanding, you know, uh, all the, particularly the baits. I mean, I'd love to, to talk about that too, right. because, um, let it rip tater chip, you know, I, I, I collect all the, the winning baits steals. If I'm, by collecting. What? He means steals. <laughs> no, I ask for permission and they give them to me. You've already cut the, them off when you ask. <laughs> yeah. Can I have I these? ask? I ask. <laughs> yeah. I've already, can I have these? Yeah, you just right. won. Can I have <laughs> these? <laughs> so this is the shaky, uh, shaky fish that Will's dad developed. And, you know, they come with these little Scrounge plastic head? rubber, blades and they slip over the jig head and i think aaron martin's had something to do with the the detailed development of these and these are adjustable so you literally i can't do it without probably sticking my finger with this hook but ultimately it comes out like this and you have this blade and it wobbles it, it's, it's the original really scrounger correct like i don't know the actual like i think that there's, i know there's another company that uses scrounger but they invented that because I remember Aaron used to come up and he'd be like, I caught him on the scrounger, not the, not the other scrounger, but the original scrounger, Bill uh, Davis Lewis. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> impression, actually. <laughs> um, and all. Well, he told me they were, the, you know, these, these blades are water, they're soft blades and they're water yeah. cut, water uh, cut. And, and so the action on these things is just, you know, it's, it's ultimately just a, uh, I don't know what you call that, a dirt rig with a blade on it. Yeah. Yeah. And it has this really erratic uh, action to it. And each time he would be in a specific spot, knowing there's a boulder in the current, and we're talking about up towards the tail race or in the tail race, knowing that area so well, 
where the boulders and the eddies are are located, you know, and where to throw, where the fish stage pre-spawn and post-spawn moving up towards the dam. And these are obviously, you know this, but to those that don't, you know, these are um, these are spotted bass, Alabama spotted, Coosa River spotted bass, and and they act different, right? They're yeah. And, and he knows them so well, and he fished the tail race knowing this was late, l- late in the spawn, mostly post-spawn, but still fishing for the spawn. So he would fish like, okay, this is where the post-spawn fish stage, the bigger females that, that are just coming out of the dam right and then he'd catch one or two there and he move up into the corner of the dam knowing where the fish really like to spawn and then we would literally in a in a in very you know uh, abnormally located that close to the gates on the dam itself he would motor up into that in that heavy heavy current um, even with his trolling motor, knowing how to get through the navigate through the boulders to get to that first gate. And with two turbines or three turbines running, he was flipping this plastic soft bait in there, knowing exactly where to bounce it off the corner of the wall. So it would flush back in with the current and those fish drum catfish and spotted bass were feeding. I mean, it was remarkably, it was, it was a remarkable experience. I'd never done any of those things with anyone, even at Pickwick with, you know, where Steve Kennedy and Kobe Krieger, they're always in the tail race, you know, at these tournaments. And this was above and beyond that because he, he knows it so well and he knew what to do. It was, it was quite remarkable. Yeah, I mean, you're you're not just watching an angler with a lifetime of experience doing that. You're watching generations because his dad exactly. taught him. You know what I mean? Like it's, exactly. You're seeing somebody and Steve Kendi, who's really good at that. But Steve kendy has been distracted from that for the last 15 years of his life, chasing fish in California and stuff. Will Davis Jr., I mean, that's what he does. You're seeing somebody that's truly one of the best at it. Here's a weird thing, and I don't know if he ever brought it up though, because I'd like to, I would like to ask him a lot of things on stage, but it, it was you just such, <laughs> it, it was mayhem. Well, we, we also wanted to live. Um, why is that head so important there? Because, you know, as an angler, you think that the extra action wouldn't matter as much in the current because it's getting thrown, tossed around as much as it is. Did, did he ever address that? No, I don't think he ever said that specifically, but my guess would be because he started out along the rocks uh, below the tail race yeah. uh, along the, between the first Island and, and the rip wrap, he was tossing that thing in there. No, he was like, you know, I've caught 23 pounds here before and many times and won lots of money here. And I think throw pitching that thing um, into the current along the edge of that bank as it floats down in heavy current, it that that head gives it that action, so it's not just dead floating through there. It looks like a live bait trying yeah. to, you know, f- either fight the current or swim with the current, and it just adds that extra action that triggers fish to bite it. I think it just looks more alive. I wonder how much of it also probably has to do with feel too, because you could be you're feeling that vibration the whole way back, so that knowing any, inter- any interruption of that vibration. Not only it allows you to feel fish, but also like, you know, when it's hitting rocks and it, it beat grass or whatever that, that, that could very well be too. That's something you'll have to ask will, but you know, I learned, I mean, what's will 26 or 27 years old, young man, I His don't know wife, how old he is. That's when I was, had, if you noticed, I was distracted a second ago. I was literally Googling to see how young he is, but it doesn't I, I have his age for whatever I think he's reason. 27. I think I asked him that he's Ageless. 27. His, his wife, they just had a, a, a new baby. What first less than mother's a year day. ago, it was first, first mother's, mother's day. day. Yeah. yeah. Um, his dad was emotional. His mom was emotional. They're all there supporting him. Like he was playing a little league baseball game. Yeah. You know, street. it's just, did you see the picture street got, Oh, there's yeah. a, and oh, I don't yeah. even know if it was in the main gallery yet, but there's a cool picture. So on the Bassmaster stages, we have that elite series center thing, which, I hate how, I don't know why, and hopefully they fix it at some point. You see the two black stretches between, which is backstage, 
Right. I don't know why it just isn't wide to cover that off because 99% of the time, the stuff you see from back there is stuff you don't want in the shot. It's a photographer reading around the corner or it's, you know, a family member and generally they're, you know, they're not any, they're not making any the kind of face they want to have in a picture. Um, they all look at the picture and be like, ah, that's not how they're I look. Crying or sad. That's exactly how Happy you look. Happy crying or sad stuff. crying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so he wins. And what we talked about is Will threw his arms up in the air and the crowd threw their arms up there. Dude, Overstreet is this picture where Will's like, and his dad is right behind him with the exact same look. And it's just like, man, the history of their family in that area. I mean, it was a pretty freaking incredible picture. It really was. And, you know, everything that he did, decisions that he made. So, you know, he kept going back to a spot downstream from the tail races, even downstream from the first island quite a ways. And there was still heavy current there. And he was fishing this seam, this yeah. this sort of riff, riffle seam. And to the left, as we're facing into the current, and these two boulders to the right. And he's like, and, and there he was actually throwing, he did catch several on the shaky fish, but he was also throwing a, a shaky head in there with a worm on it. And he would try to get this worm that would take the perfect cast with his boat in spot lock. Cause they were in heavy current. It was almost like the St. Lawrence river kind of current. Right. Yeah. And, and with big boulders in the water, although it wasn't very clear, it still kind of had that feel to it. Right. Like you're, you're fishing for brown trout in a stream below a dam, right? Yeah, but he knows where every boulder is. He knows oh, every dude. current oh, seam. Dude. Like, it, there's no guessing. Like, every cast. Oh, no. I was watching him, and I'm like, this dude, every cast dude. has been premeditated. He knows where the next one's oh, going. Oh, he, he would look downstream and hear a boat coming and go, watch that boat's getting ready to hit a rock. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff you can do. I mean, it's a proven thing in boating. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you've experienced, not at that moment, but if you've ever seen like a boat coming towards a shoal, no matter what you do. I mean, I've tried this. Yeah. I've tried to don't, get away. Like they're this. like, and they're like flipping you the middle finger or they're just like, Hey, <laughs> Hey, <Yeah>. oh, <laughs> <laughs> why didn't you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> so his, his, his casts were off, like you said, detail oriented in, in exact locations. And what he was doing was floating that shaky head downstream until it would hit the top, hit the front edge of the boulder, roll over the top and then drop right off the other edge. And that's where those spots were waiting to take that bait in. And it was, it was, you know, the fish he caught, he would cast in there three or four times ago. They're not there. Let's go. We would move. Then we'd come back two hours later and he would cast in there and go, hopefully they're there. If they're there, we'll know it, is, you know, immediately. He'd toss that shaky head in there. Boop, come over the top. Wham. He caught a three and three quarter pound uh, spot there on day three, which was really his biggest fish. And that gave him some confidence at that point. Cause I think he only had one or two fish in the well at the time. So that you could tell that was like, okay, now, you know, now I, he's thinking about what I need to do next. Right. And he has all these different locations and techniques and tools in his head thinking, where do I need to go next? And so, man, I, I'll tell you, I, I mean, you know, riding in the boat with, with, lots of different anglers and all the things that I've been able to learn over the years with these brilliant, you know, bass fishermen, that was definitely day three and four with Will Davis Jr. were two of the most educational days that I've had on the water based on specific, a specific body of water and what to do with, you know, spotted bass and, and where to go find them when you can't find them elsewhere. Yeah. It's, so it's day really three, cool. he ends up in third and uh, you're with him again on championship Sunday. Well, what was the vibe like, and I don't think enough was made out of it. I mean, I kept saying it, but if you look at it, like one, two, and three was one of these things is oh, not like God. the other one. One yeah. of these yeah. things is not the same. Yeah. He's against two of the most decorated and on top of the, maybe the two arguably Arguably the two, you know, like if you look at them, 
I mean, has Jason Christie ever been fishing better? Has Brandon Polnick ever been fishing better? They're two of the most decorated pros on tour. Two of the scariest guys to have in first and second and be sitting in third place. But, dude, that's the dream. When you're a little kid growing up on Lay Lake, you're like, one day. it's And at that time, it wasn't Christy and Polnick. Maybe it was, you know, Kevin and Skeet that were ahead of you. But right. basically, you got the Kevin and Skeet of today ahead of you. You got your childhood dream. Did you... Did he even think about that? That did, did even come into play? Because he doesn't feel like he's not he scared. Did. No, it was, the, he owns that lake, dude. That's his <laughs> body of water. And I think if he were somewhere else, perhaps it would have come into play and he didn't know what he was going to go do or he didn't have any ideas about how he was going to go try to figure out what was going to work best on day four. But like you said, I think Ronnie Moore said it best uh, in one of the clips, he said, that's like having, you know, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant in front of you, you know, and you're just trying to score a basket. <laughs> and, and, I, you know, I asked him, I said, how are you feeling this morning? He goes, man, I'm hungry. I'm gonna go get a biscuit. And his dad brought him <laughs> one, of, one of those sausage. How biscuits. are you feeling? <laughs> I'm hungry. Said, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna go get, get a biscuit. biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how Alabama is that? Oh, <laughs> uh. <laughs> Wow. And so, yeah. So, and, and, uh, I, I just don't think he felt the pressure, man. I, I, he knew he was going to go catch fish. He just didn't know, you know, really how or how much he was going to catch. And quite frankly, the first spot he, he abandoned the, the dam that early that morning. He's like, I'm not even going to go up there. I'm going to go try to catch some shallow fish on this spot that I've been saving. I haven't even been there yet, the entire uh -huh. tournament. And we're going to go throw, you know, a swim jig and a shaky fish um, in this grass where I know some pretty big ones are. So we roll up to this point. Really, it was only like a mile from takeoff. And he pulls up and there's fish. There's fish busting. There's shad flickering. I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, this, these were big, these were big wakes too in the grass thinking, okay, he, you know, this is what it's like to fish with someone that knows a lake so well that you would save a spot like this for the last yeah. day. Right? And admit it at takeoff, which I loved. Like exactly. I said to him, have you saved in every local will be like, well, you know, you can't keep any secrets around here. And, uh, you know, yeah. but they all try to save something. He said, yeah, I've saved some stuff that I haven't been to. Didn't say that. It's going to be lights out. He saved some stuff that he hasn't been to. And it wasn't lights out first thing, was it? No, he, he actually never caught a fish. Oh, no, he did. He caught like a two pounder. The first and only fish he caught that morning and all morning into midday was one fish in that grass he picked up, but obviously wasn't the fish. I mean, he could go catch a two pounder anywhere. Right. And so it was, it was a struggle, but he never thought that he never thought oh well i mean it's just kind of like okay well let's move on to the next spot so we zigzag back and forth up the river staying on the main river looking for you know him hitting some old spots that he knew about and it really never developed so finally once the sun came out we did we headed back up to the tail race and nothing you know no 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 shaky fish no shaky head worm no no staging area no spawning fish no fish up in the gates at the dam nothing zero and it was hot <laughs> yeah everyone well left kobe krieger left no kobe krieger wasn't there uh, er, no there was hardly anyone up at the dam and which we have to talk about something before because remember day three the guy was I'm literally, literally, just so you know how prepared I am. I'm literally scrolling through your texts. This is your yeah. text. I don't want to show because the Lord knows what you said in that little yeah. section of text. <laughs> but um, I was literally screaming, scrolling through to see if that was Saturday or Sunday. So yeah, we did jump ahead. Something happened on Saturday. Are we going to talk about that? We might as well. Go. I mean, the guy was trying to kill us. He was throwing. There were some guys fishing the concrete wall over on the far end of the, on the far side of the dam. And they were not happy that will pulled up into the, the they're fishing from shore. They're fishing from shore with big spinning rods, catching catfish and drum and freaking 
who you know were they using big triangle was, weights is that the ones that we i don't using? know they were big lead weights <laughs> and the guy you could hear him when you go back and look at the clip of will catching like a a two and a half or two and three quarter pound spot out of that first gate hole he catches one before he catches it you could hear these guys whistling at us behind us there you know and so will turned around and looked at him and didn't know the guy threw his hands up like this was like what are you doing and will threw his hands up like going i'm going fishing i've been doing this my whole life i'm just going this is i'm in a tournament right i'm just trying and to if you were with anyone else you'd be like maybe he doesn't know the where you're supposed to fish here dude if i'd will have been Davis in, junior knows where to fish there if i'd have been with anyone else i'd be like uh why are we going up here this is because it, it's 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 con i mean if you got in trouble up there it would be compromising let's just oh, say yeah. that right yeah. you got to know what you're doing that wasn't his first time up there no and <laughs> you gotta wear sure. a life jacket the whole time you're up there and everything obviously. yeah safety for i mean it's sketchy but anyway so this guy starts launching a, a, what looked to be like a two ounce egg weight at us and literally hit right behind the boat like i'm Ooh. talking right behind me and will goes you know i can't say exactly what he said but something he shouldn't have said is, probably this is unacceptable <laughs> <laughs> with a with which some it, strong adjectives was. this is yeah, unacceptable very, with strong and then i started dropping strong adjectives a lot and of i turned around and i turned i'm like okay sometimes in these situations I'd rather have a camera than a gun <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because I turn the camera around and start filming this guy and he put his rod down, totally went completely like nothing to see here. And I'm going, Oh yeah, I'm getting this guy's face on camera because had he hit me in the back of the melon with that Did you thing, could kill somebody easily. He was a hundred and I mean, I, he was a hundred yards away from us. He was launching that thing. I'm talking about, I'm talking about like, shore casting from the beach in panama city you know like he was launching that thing and it got serious and i started thinking about that dude if that thing would have hit me in the back of the head or in the spine or anywhere that thing would have freaking hurt and and if not damaged me or killed me or whatever or or, or even will and so at the very least it would have knocked you out and you probably would have fallen in the water, which we've already explained. Then it could then it could have killed me a different way. Yeah. Right. So Will trolls, he 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 just kind of uh, swings around the side of the dam into the eddy and picks up the phone. He goes, Can I am I allowed to call Lisa? I said, Hell yeah, call Lisa right now and ask her what to do because you know, he wants to stay up there and fish because they're running two turbines and he may, he caught a two and a half pounder the first cast. So he wants to stay there and fish. He's not trying to get in their way. He's as far away from them as he could possibly be without getting in their way, but then thinking he's in their way. Right. And no one clear, else is Lisa is LT Lisa yeah. Talmadge, Lisa Bassmaster Talmadge. tournament director, right. former guest on this show. Continue. Yeah, that's right. And so he calls Lisa and says, you know, what should I do? And she says, well, call the authorities, call the game warden, and which he's very familiar with those guys. He's got them all their numbers in his phone. So he calls the game warden on the guys. And instead of staying there and provoking the situation to his credit, he decided, you know what, let's just leave. So he, he, wow. he tro trolls out into the current cuts back through the gap, goes back down to the spawning area, doesn't catch anything, goes downstream, doesn't catch anything, and then we're out of there. We came back eventually, but we were out of there not knowing whether the authorities showed up or what. But nevertheless, that was a uh that was an intense few minutes there, particularly with as as loud as it I mean Yeah, it's so intense. Everything's intensified. It's so intense, man. Yeah. I mean, it's like being in a car wash. You know, yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it's intense. The current is heavy. The water, there's big boulders. You're you know. yelling all the time, whether you know it or not, because you have to, because it's that loud. Like when you're yeah. talking to each other, it's not talking anymore. It's yelling. And I'm focused because I can't fall out of the boat because that's yeah, a that's whole key. other scenario. You know, he's trying to keep it nosed into the current to where he can make the right cast. And he's just making like, you know, 20 foot casts, if that into the corner of this, into this concrete wall. And so, 
yeah, you know, it was, it was just one of those moments. And for those, you know, I, I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to anyway. You know, the locals that get upset at, at anglers and, and tournaments being in these locations, you know, maybe I understand why you're upset. You may only have weekends to fish or whatever it is. But, man, don't take it that far. These are – you're talking about lives are at stake and – and things don't 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 just don't go there man that's that's ridiculous it, it's not worth that well and i think that's one of those situations that i i try to always tell my kids to try and evaluate risk versus reward like the reward of that like the person that did that probably didn't even think through what's happening you know what right, i mean they're exactly. just pissed that oh i'm not catching as many as i like to and there's a boat and that's my excuse don't be dumb because that could have gone really really bad for you know what i mean a two ounce weight coming at you at that speed can i mean bobby lane's hook set ain't got crap on that yeah no 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 no, no. Uh, that felt like a 22 bullet this would have felt like a cannonball so being know? as close a friend as we are jake had texted me on saturday tell me about this and i was instantly worried about him i said make sure you're safe get back safe but get every detail for the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't leave anything out. Give me a couple of screenshots if you can. <laughs> well, thankfully uh, you guys weren't hurt and uh, hopefully yeah. that person was dealt with in one way or another. And um, we're all just fishing. Let's that, freaking get along. We're all just fishing. That's right. So where do we go from here? Do we want to go back to day four now? Since we're through day three. Well, yeah, drama. we're through day three. The morning of day four. Will Davis is feeling no pressure whatsoever. He just wants He's a just biscuit. Hungry. He's starving. That's, that's it. And he goes and um blanks ten anglers left and um blanks in his first ten spots. His first ten. Which which here's what impressed me about him. And I the result is always hindsight 2020. But in the morning I remember thinking, hmm, that's different. Cause I saw that and how long it went with him out him having a limit. And I'm like, there's a lot of times where a local that's what they first thing they do. They, I mean, I'm sure he had a bunch of spots where he can go catch two pounders here. And you know what I mean? Let's, let's go get 10 pounds. In the boat. To win. But he fished to win from the start. Like he, he, as young as he is and as inexperienced as he is in elite series competition, he knew that a two pounder doesn't help him because he doesn't want to have it in his bag at the end of the day. Anyways. Exactly. I mean, he, he knew, and he knew he was what, two and a half pounds or three pounds behind Paul three and a half back. I three, think okay. He was. Three and a half back from Paul and and a pound and a half or two pounds behind Jason freaking Christie. Right. Who just <laughs> caught 23 pounds, including and a nine, and, four. Yeah. And even if you remove the nine, four, he still had a good day. Like he's not catching little fish. He had something figured out. Right? Yeah. And Paul and had it figured out the whole time. It wasn't like, you know, it, it, that the, any of those two guys were just lucky to be there. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, he blanks. And then we go up to the dam and, and nothing. I mean, it was dead. It was just dead. Even the bank fishermen were struggling. I was filming those guys, uh, swimming out to those rocks with a cast net catching gizzard shad by hand. That's how, you know, dead it was. And so, I Nobody remember throwing lead weights at you on Sunday. No, no, Either no, got arrested no, or went are, to church yeah, to were, repent. Yeah, one or the that's other. Right, that's right. <laughs> and so I remember asking Will, he goes, okay, you know, we're out of here. We're done. The, the damn, this is over. We're done. And I said, are you going back downstream to the boulders? He goes, yeah, we're going to hit that once. And then I've got some other things up my sleeve that I want to try. So we go back down to the two boulders, the shaky head boulders, nothing. So he pretty quickly you know, pulls everything up. He goes, we're going to go for a little ride. And we pull into this, this Creek, the mouth of this Creek. And it looked like a, uh, a cotton mouth Creek is what it looked like. And he's, uh, and I said, so well, what's what up? is a cotton? Why, why would it look like a cotton mouth? It just creek looked like stagnant water with, you know, with old, uh, no wake signs, you know, underwater. It just looked like, it just looked like an abandoned, creek and i actually we did we didn't see the cotton mouse we said yeah exactly <laughs> deliverance yeah <laughs> and so we start easing up this creek and and he sees a two and a half pounder on the bank and will's only got i think three fish in his will at this point and it's 
one o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, it's getting late. He's still yeah. not in panic mode or even stress mode. He didn't still, see, he didn't seem nope, pretty calm. Nope. Totally unrattled, totally still confident. We're going to go Very in here cool. and find two, three pounders. That's what he cool. was thinking. So he pulls up and there's a two and a half pounder on a bed. Right. And so he's trying to catch her. And I mean, he is, he's not fishing it like Drew Cook. He's not fishing it like Drew Benton. He's, he's very quick. If they don't react, he's just, he's just constantly flipping, 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 flipping. So in the initial, dr- like the, he doesn't swim it back. It's just the first drop. If they eat it, then he- yep. If they, yep. Uh, super fast bed fishermen, at least for that time of year yeah. anyway. And so he looks over to his right and there's like the end of a log sticking up out of the water and a freaking gigantic bass, like a seven or eight pounder swims over the top of the log and down. And he goes, Oh my God, look at that freaking bass right there. And I turn, I just saw her tail going down. She was totally calm, not spooked, but he didn't even try to catch her. He knew where she went down, but he didn't try to flip. Maybe he flipped one time, but that was it. And I thought to myself, he knows by the way that fish is acting because that's a winning fish. Yeah. That is a hundred percent right now, a fish that would win the tournament from shut and slam the door on this tournament. If he ca- catches it, he didn't even try. He must know that that fish is pretty much uncatchable because he's still flipping in there for this two and a half pounder. So he picks up, he's like, dude, the water's like this deep. And I, I'm actually filming the fish. I can see it up against the bank and it's under the shade line and there's little limbs and all kinds of crap sticking off the bank, you know, in, in front of this, where this fish is sitting. And, and, and he picks up a freaking jerk bait, a bomber, a jerk bait. Okay. And he starts flipping this thing in there from, 15 feet away he's pulled down flipping this thing and jerking it across the bed boom this fish comes up and snags it after a thousand casts with a drop shot snaps. and a worm a crawfish all kinds of stuff and just freaking snap this fish into place catches it throws it in the live well um and so he's got i think he's got four fish at this point one of which was an 11 ounce barely 12 inch fish that you have to step on to make 12 inches right and that's in the well knowing he's got to get rid of that so he, he he keeps moving down into this creek towards the back end of it and and there they are there's snakes and then sure enough he sees another three pound fish on a bed and again he goes to fast bed fishing for it with all these different baits throws the bomber a in there and he 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 takes he, he takes the back hook off because these fish were hitting it and not getting it okay and he takes the back hook off puts a smaller like a number three gamagatsu on the back throws that in there boom catches it this is like a three and a half pounder this is like maybe even a four pound fish and he, he swings it over. I actually caught the fish coming up and grabbing the jerk bait off of this, this stick that was sticking out of the water. The fish comes up, grabs it, and he immediately sets the hook, and it's all in the lens. I'm zoomed in on this fish. It's like one of the coolest bites I've ever captured. And then he swings this fish over to the, to the left side of the boat, and he's about to grab it, and it shakes really bad, and he pulls his hand back, and it turns back. And comes back to him and he reaches down to grab it by the back and boom, the hook goes right, right in his thumb. And literally fish start shaking. You could see his hand shaking. I'm just going, oh my God, this sucks. Right. You know, that hook is buried. So he, gra- he just, he just reaches in and grabs the ba- uh, uh, loaf or bread loaves, the fish gets it in the boat. And I go, dude, you got that hook buried in your hand. He goes, "Uh uh-huh. So he puts the fish between his legs, gets the jerk bait out of the fish's mouth. He's got the jerk bait in one hand, the fish in the other, and he's holding up going, looky there, looky there what we did. I knew that was going to happen. It was totally worth it. (laughs) (laughs) Throws it in the live well. And then we're trying to figure out what we're going to do to get this hook out of his hand. As a matter of fact, I just happened to have the hook, all the barbs, are cut off of the shanks and this is the actual hook that was in his hand and so 
I go, he goes, can you help me? Are you allowed to help me? I go, yeah, I think, you know, in, in this kind of a situation, as long as it's safety oriented, I'm more than allowed to help you figure this out. So I said, do you have any wire cutters? And he asked me, do you know how to get the hook out with the, the uh, braided line method? I said, yeah. And then I started, I pulled my phone out and started watching a YouTube video on how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> literally, yeah i'm literally totally good at it yeah let but me let me refresh my memory so it's been remember. a while yeah, it's been a while <laughs> so we get the we get the crank or the uh jerk bait off the hook and get yeah, rid of it geez. so he's just got one hook in his hand yeah and it's important people don't yeah. do that and they end up with other hooks in their body worse and then it's worse yeah <laughs> yeah always then disconnect like the bait the fish gets disconnected first and the next thing that gets disconnected is the bait and the rest of the hooks right like so you're isolate down to one the hook. fish so the fish isn't flopping around and then do all the rest of the oh. stuff so we're down to one hook and it's buried i mean it's literally buried in his thumb i think maybe even close to that tendon and you could barely see the tip sticking out uh you know an inch away or whatever it was and he goes what do you think i should do and I said, well, that's a short, that's a short shank hook. I mean, look at it. Yeah. It's very short shanked, right? Uh -huh. So you can't get to where you need to, to get this hook out, even with the, 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 uh, braided line method. You got to pop her through. Is that what I you said, did? you're going to have to push it through. And he goes, oh, dude, I don't know if I can do that or not. I go, do you want me to do it? And he goes, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, why don't you get some ice? Let's get some ice cubes and put it on there and numb this, which I've done before. Numb it. And then, you know, he grabbed a towel or his, his hoodie and bit down on it like a bit, a soft numb bit. It and dumb and it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he finally pushed it through and he's like, now what? And I said, well, do you have any wire snips? Cause if you got some wire cutters, you we'll just, cut the, I'll cut that barb off and just back it out. And it, you won't even feel it after that. And he goes, I don't have any. I said, you don't have any wire cutters in your boat. He goes, no. And I'm like, Oh my God. So he said, let's go. We're going to, we're going to have to go find someone. Cause I can't cast with this thing in my thumb. So he pulls up tilts down starts a big engine and we're going out to the mouth of this Creek. And he's just going, please, Lord, please let me find some wire stamp. This is, this is like two o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. We're an hour, 50 minutes from weigh in. Okay. He's got like 20 or 30 minutes to fish. Even if we were to turn around and go back and fish, he's only got Sweltering 30 minutes. Hot. Just like totally sweat, against sweaty. all odds. Yeah. Totally. So he goes out to the mouth and there's a guy in his boat at the very mouth of the Creek. He's just standing there and we're waving him down. Didn't want him to leave. Cause he's getting ready to pull up and move out of our way. And the, he pulls up to him and the guy goes, are you Will Davis jr? He's like, yes, sir. I need your help. He goes, what can I do for you? He goes, do you have any wire cutters? And he looked down and he goes, yeah, I got some right here. And he reaches down on his deck and he's got some wire cutters right there, throws them onto the deck of the boat. I grab them and, and Will pulls his thumb back. I cut the barb off. He backs the hook out and it's over literally. And instantly. I throw instantly, I throw the uh, wire cutters back on the guy's deck and here's what Will did. This is the humanitarian side of him and the, the thing you have to appreciate about Will Davis Jr. He goes, you got a phone on you? And he says, yeah. He pulls his phone and he goes, take my number down. You know, whatever, 777-888-1900, whatever. And, Be cool the guy, and he, goes, he goes, call me, call me when we get back to weigh-ins call me and then he he starts his motor and turns around and he goes dude i'm gonna send that guy the biggest care package he's ever received in his life that was so cool that he did that for us so we go back into the creek puts the trolling motor down goes past all these concrete obstacles and barriers that we had to get around goes to the very back end of the creek and sees like a two pounder swimming over the top of a rock Throws that jerk bait in there, nothing. The fish goes down, comes back around, goes back to another fish that he didn't catch on the bank that was like a three pounder, goes back there, throws that jerk bait in there, catches the three pounder, 
calls the 11 ounce 12 incher that he had in the well and he's like we gotta go and so we haul ass back to the weigh-in and i'm literally going he asked me he goes how much how much weight do you think i have i go i know you got 14 pounds for sure he goes you think i got 15 i said i don't think so man this is gonna be you know this is this is this is gonna be crazy Oh. So we get back to the dock and I had him at 14 pounds, even on bass track. And I kept going through my head. I'm trying to come up with another five ou- or six ounces, whatever it was, knowing what Brandon had on bass track, because he weighs all of his fish. And and I knew he was pretty close, but I didn't know he had a dead fish at the time. And I was just, Neither like, did oh. he right? Yeah. Tr- true enough. <laughs> and so I'm just like, this is going to be really, really tight. Yeah, and it was one it, ounce on bass track. It was there was one ounce separating them on bass track. One and ounce. Will had just ounces. taken the lead. Yeah, by calling thought, that eleven ouncer. Like when I yeah. said, um, "Well, what was like thirty minutes left in that?" And just everybody in the trail, somebody said, "I heard Will Davis just took the lead or whatever." And it's like, and everybody's like, "It's one ounce." Like Lisa was like, "You know, there's one ounce in between there's them." I mean, it could be ounce. anything, and it ended up being two ounces for a victory but it, it was you know nobody knew who was winning that one that's the nice thing no and that was yeah so that was that was how will davis jr you know again you know give paul nick credit for having the weight obviously a, a unfortunate situation with the dead fish jason losing a five or six pounder at the boat being could have been a winning fish taking all that away you cannot take away what Will no, Davis Jr. did. Well, in the last Will Davis hour. had a hook jammed in his hand with an hour left to go. You know what exactly. I mean? Like everybody had their. I mean, that's what wins tournaments. There's these tails at every single one of them. All that's going through my mind right now is hope that guy. I'm sure that guy will call him. But I mean, dude, somewhere he, in no, Alabama. No, he came to the way in. Oh, did he? Because I'm just I, I hugged him. Somewhere in the oh, he, way, and there's some like somewhere there's a dude in Alabama at a bass club telling everybody, I'm telling you, I was just sitting there, and Will Davis Jr. came out, <laughs> I threw him my wire cutters, saved his day. He went and won the tournament. And they're like, Whatever, Harold, you're so full yeah. of crap. Go finish your business. <laughs> of course, Harold. Will Davis Jr. has wire cutters in his boat. Don't be a fool. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So you met that and, guy at the way in. Yeah, he w- he was he was at the front stage. Uh right after you know he hoisted his trophy and will acknowledged him and i jumped down and jumped over the fence and gave that guy a big old hug and said man thank you so much that was that was so nice and you just have i don't know where you came from but you were at the right place at the right time it was pretty cool really really checking into the dock i mean obviously his family and everybody's all around it's they're Probably pumped. Cool Everybody's just jacked knowing he just took the lead and they're all, you know, everyone's asking me, what do I think he really has? And I said, 14 pounds. Like, yeah. This is, it. I've never felt so confident about how close I was on a bass track weight in my life, <laughs> you know? And, and, and he ends up with people 14. always ask that. I hate I that the media what and everybody's like, really got, what, what, what is he? You're lying, right? Like it's not as close. Well, I'm but usually, we can't- <laughs> I'm usually a pound and a half in big, in big, big bass tournaments. I'm usually about a pound and a half to two pounds shy of the actual weight. And it's not because I'm trying to do that. It's because I'm always like, you know, a quarter pound off of each fish. And nobody ever says it's a three and three quarters. It's a three and a half or it's a four, you know, it doesn't. It's never three. It's always either a quarter pound. I, I want to be lower than higher because I don't yeah. want, I don't want Always. to be over overestimated. Yeah. And, and so, and I, but this was one time I felt like, man, I hope he has the 14 that I think he has. And he ended up having 14 too. Right. Yeah. Th- that yeah. was his, that was his final weight was 14 too. Was it? And, I mean, that dude, to yeah. be honest, that way in was such a, it's so weird. Like I'm up there and I'm watching the weather come across and you're and you're like, I'm looking at people in the crowd and you know, there was making sure people are safe. <laughs> Literally. It was a weird, weird. I remember uh, one you of my saying, biggest we got to cut this short. Yeah. Well, we have to, we had to, yeah. because it was like, and then after everyone left, the sun came out and it was beautiful. Like it turned <laughs> the whole place into a sauna. Um, 
but he, we we had to. But dude, one of my biggest regrets the whole tournament is I said David versus Goliath on stage, and literally as I walked off stage, I would was I was like, it's Davis versus Goliath. Like, but I know I would have said that. If there wasn't all the other crap going on, I know, like, just knowing how my head, and I'm like, but it is the perfect call for who, what happened? Like, he, it's Davis versus two Goliaths, and he took them both out. Um, Things went his way on both sides of that, where the things he needed to have happen with Polinick and Christy happened, and the things he needed to have happen with himself. To be honest with you, when we were, when we were motoring out, when he had that hook in his thumb, I'm going, Oh my God. He was so close. Like yes. he, he doesn't even know how close he was. He was another three pounder, which we saw back there. He was that fish away from probably winning this tournament. And he'll, 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 until he hears this story, he'll never know that how close he was. And that one hook got in his way. Yeah. And when he got that hook out, when that guy was at the mouth of the Creek and he was able to turn around and go back in there with 20 minutes left to fish. I mean, there was 50 minutes left in the tournament, but he, had, he was 25 minutes away from the ramp, right. From, from takeoff. So he only had 20 to 22 or 23 minutes to fish. And Lo and behold, it was just enough time to give him to go back in there and catch that last bed fish that, that ultimately won the tournament. It was, it was incredible, incredible it, experience. It was. And then having his friends like all oh, rush the stage and as on a personal note to his buddy that had the uh, drill truck horn, I would love one. Oh, yeah. I would, if you're yeah. ever looking for a hard to get <laughs> gift for me, I would love one and uh, I'll use it on stage as obnoxiously as possible. Um, that that thing was awesome. That's like, that's like what you hear at NFL football games. Oh, it was awesome. And dude would keep it in this little bag. I don't know if it like, and it, and when it was the time rain. I watched him, I see him un- and he put it right back in the bag. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, was awesome, pretty man. awesome. It's a good um, crowd too. Great crowd. Great event. Great champion. Um, I, I didn't get a great to work sport. With, yeah. Best sport in dude. freaking world, dude. dude. Like the best people. That's what I love about it because other sports, you see people's family around them and it, it's cool. Like, okay, that's his dad or whatever. But the pride that you see, saw his, from his father is it's let's, I mean, like when he handed his dad the trophy, I said to him, I looked at him and he said off the mic and he said to get on the mic, but he's like, he deserves it way more, more than, than me. Like, it, it's just, it's so cool. Um, I didn't get to work with, with Davey this time because he was in the studio um because zona was off this week um hope that was good z good fishing it he was like. fishing yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ah. He'd catch a seven pound smallmouth and uh i was jealous of z but didn't get to work with davy but i had trip weldon on day one with me alive which was awesome trip was so good so like, cool. he, he did the first segment we get to break and he's like and the whole way through it i'm just like this sounds exactly like somebody who's watched live his oh, whole life and like knows bass fishing knows when to lay off. Like as soon as the anglers talked, he just stopped talking. Like he, it was trip was great. He looked Perfect. awesome. Him and his wife, Mary, we had barbecue for, for lunch. I, this is the loser I am. I'm like, let's go for lunch guys. I mean, they get to see trip and Mary. They're, they're retired. They're on a pension. I'm going to take them out for lunch. Like where are we going to go? And we went to uh, the tin top barbecue, uh, a local spot that was recommended. It was very good. Um, and then we, I walk in there and I, I realized I left my wallet in the trail. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. So I couldn't even buy them lunch. <laughs> I had to be like, trip, here's the loser. I am, uh, you, you got to buy I forgot for my me. wallet, <laughs> but I thank him for coming out and doing that. It was great to see them both looking so great. And, uh, they're always fun. Then I got to work with overstreet for two days in a row. That was which cool. I loved, I mean, overstreet on live is some of my favorite stuff just cause it's, I mean, we'd done stuff in the past where I think Overstreet tried to kind of be a live dude. You know what I mean? Do we, but he was just calm and like himself and just, I can hear his voice on call. So great. This is so cool, man. So great. I love doing it with him. Um, And then on day four, I got to do it with Lee Livesey, which was awesome. Again. I mean, Lee added in so much good insight and it was cool because me and Davey get to work together all the time. And I love working with Davey. Um, but it was cool because when you worked with different people, all of a sudden after segments, it was like when we first started, all of a sudden my phone would light up and people would be like, oh, trip was really good. And mm-hmm. you'd see trips. Fun. So it was kind of cool in that way. Um, 
And uh, so I thank them all for doing the segments with me and being part of Bass Live. And hopefully Davey Hyde shows up at the next event. He will. He'll he'll be there. He promised me he's coming to the next one. Um, but here's random things I wrote down. I said, let's write down some stuff. Here's random things that I wrote down that um, Lee Livesey was present to see. Brian New is a spaz. We always call him a spaz. Well, at one point uh, on day three or day four, whatever it was, he forgets something in his truck. So he comes back to shore and me and Lee always joke. We're like, there's no pro we've ever seen fall over more. Like, just trip fall. And fall, huh? <laughs> so dude, one of the greatest moments is new is sprinting like from the dot. And dude, he, you know, those white partitions we have around all the venue, they're like kind of mm-hmm. PVC pipe partition. Mm-hmm. They've got sponsor banners on them and stuff. And below them is like a white fence type thing. Mesh. Yeah. Yeah. Mesh. Brian New comes running to hurdle it, and he like, I mean, he could have gone around it, but he's gonna hurdle it, and he didn't get anywhere close. Halfway oh, up, no. boom, hits the ground, boom, lands on his belly in the concrete. Yeah, gets up, Ugh. and just goes right back to run. <laughs> oh my! I saw goodness. it with Lee at the way, and Lee's like, "You must have blood on you." He's like, "No, no, I just got up and kept going." <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Um, Caleb Summerall forgot his plug on day three. That was fun. His boat almost sank. So that he had so, a good tournament, which he, he needed. did. Great tournament. Yeah. Good Kudos to, see. to you, Caleb. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was a great event. It was um Brandon Cobb, all. top ten. Again. Dude, that guy's freaking smoking him this year, man. Yeah, he's incredible. Uh, I'm really excited to see Orange is gonna be key. Um, mm-hmm. and I'm really excited to see like dude, Cobb just doesn't have a great record when it comes to small mo. I mean, he has caught him at the St. Lawrence River, but when he did, he caught him on like a Carolina rig, largemouth fishing him. But the way he fishes, what he does to sight fish all a lot of the year outside of the sight times when you just think they're on the beds. I don't know why he, why that doesn't work from smallmouth fishing, because that's literally one of the, I mean, the Johnsons do that a lot, um, but it's going to be a fun angle of the year. I mean, you look at the people behind him, just, just Brandon Palnick slowly climbing up that Drew that Cook, board. Brand, and Drew hey, Cook and Will Davis lot of, Jr. was in sixth and AOI going into the Lay Lake, and I don't um, know what that did for his AOI standings, but he must be in the top five now, too. I know he's leading rookie of the year now. I didn't check angle. Yeah, of the year I looked, that, I looked on the leaderboard where they, you know, they, on the far right, they show the angler of the year standings. And when I looked at it on day four, he was number six. Oh, number so, six on day. Yeah. But he, that would be assuming. Yeah. His, his points would have went up because yeah. that would have been assuming he had day three points, which was then, third place. Right. Um, and then he so, just won the tournament. He is in sixth place for Angler of the Year. I looked it up. Okay. Six right now. Yep. He's got 383 points. And leading right now is Brandon Cobb with 485. In second place, just to let you know that Cobb is the only one that really has a bit of a lead because in second place is Drew Cook with 436. So So you look at 50 points ahead of. Yeah. But he's only 50 points ahead of of Will Davis. So there's. Yeah. Three three or four people in between them that are really tight. It's Cobb, Cook, Rivette, John Cox, Kyle Welcher, Will Davis Jr., Mike Iconelli, which is going to be scary as we get How north. Cool Carl Jacobson, yeah. Pat Schlopper and Matt Airy. That's our top ten for angler. Man, we're about of to go year. up into Mike Iconelli's wheelhouse. Yeah, and and dude, I mean, um, a lot rides on this next one. I think a lot rides on orange because it's how it can ironic go wrong is that for too? so many. How 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 ironic is that? Oh well, yeah, mean, that it that it's the Sabine River that so much so much emphasis is going to be placed on. What happens when we go into the smallmouth realm? Yeah, yeah. No, a lot no of- one's beat. No one's beating Jason Christie's big fish. I'm gonna say that right now. Ooh. Last time people said that it got beat. I don't think somebody, it beat somebody, it. dude. If they beat catch. it, I will like I I will both e- ejaculate and defecate at the same time. If you <laughs> win a nine five, it's we're gonna need to climb up in aisle. <laughs> I just threw up in my mouth a little bit and I'm just swallow it. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> Sorry. I mean, it's a lot, a lot of, but that'd be pretty incredible, but, um, be insane. yeah. And, 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 and the fish would be impressive too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, a great event. Um, some great info. Did we leave anything out? I think we're good. Right. I don't know. Congratulations. To, I mean, really Brandon, Jason and will that was more than we could have ever asked for to end a tournament, particularly at the time of year we had lay Lake and what was, you know, what was going on there. Really sorry that you lost your five pounder. Really sorry that your fish died, Brandon, truly, but congratulations to will Davis jr. That was incredible. And I, and to be on the, have a front row seat to see it all go down when no one else could, it was an honor and a privilege to be there. And, uh, that, that was awesome. Yeah. Amazing event. Um, we done, right? We done. It's always, it's always good hanging out with you, Mercer. Dude. And thank you, thank Will you. Davis Jr. For healing him from his dark. Yes. That 2023 has yeah. been. Thank God that's over. <laughs> My drought is over. <laughs> thank you for the buff. All because of the buff. The buff. Nothing to do with the anglers, their generational ability to catch bass. I'm going to start charging for the buff and be like, Hey man, on day fours. Now I'm going to be like, Hey man, if you want me to wear my buff, it'll cost you 10%. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. Oh boy. Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like comment and subscribe because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to you hear.